Well, amen. Uh, if you brought a Bible this morning, I would like for you to turn with me to Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter two. I'm sorry, Second Timothy chapter three. Second Timothy chapter three. That's going, going to be our text today. Uh, I started a, a couple of weeks ago a series of messages that I called America Drinking the Kool-Aid. Uh, and I would like to continue along that line today. America Drinking the Kool-Aid. Uh, and just to get everyone, uh, catch everyone up on what that's all about. Uh, in 1978, in, back in November of 1978, uh, the, uh, there was a mass suicide and murder in Jonestown, Guyana, where over 900 people committed suicide, all were killed uh, in Jonestown. It was America's greatest civilian tragedy, uh, act of mayhem, up until 9-11, you know, the Twin Towers fell, where civilians were, were massacred by that great number. And... Uh, most of those people in Jonestown died from drinking cyanide-laced Kool-Aid that was dished out by this religious leader by the name of Jim Jones. Uh, now, Jim Jones has entered into uh, history as one of the most nefarious, uh, diabolical, twisted, demented uh, people who, who has ever lived. Uh, as, you know, many others have entered into that notoriety, Charles Manson and, and, and uh, such like. Uh, but also what entered into American uh, history, or our vocabulary at least, since then has been the expression, don't drink the Kool-Aid. And it has come to mean, it has come to symbolize uh, people swallowing wholesale without discernment anything that somebody or some institution might uh, teach, preach. Uh, you don't just drink the Kool-Aid without discernment. You make sure you know what you're swallowing. That's the whole idea. Kool-Aid in itself, you know, is just a sugary drink. It's not going to hurt anything except maybe your teeth, uh, unless it's your blood sugar, I guess. But drinking the Kool-Aid has come to represent just unthinking compliance just absolute submission to some authority, whether it's a religious authority, as, you know, Jim Jones was supposed to be a religious authority, uh, or some other authority. It could be a political or government authority. It could be uh, some business leader uh, or business model. It could be a philosophy of life that people embrace, or, or they embrace a lifestyle uh, a value system, a, a pattern of behavior, and, and when they embrace it with their whole heart, without considering the consequences of what they're doing, you know, it's you're drinking the Kool-Aid. Uh, I spoke a couple of weeks ago about the almost universally accepted now, in America anyway, practice of, of homosexuality as a normal, happy, healthy, alternate lifestyle, <laughs> Uh, when the truth is, it's anything but. It's anything but. Even if you remove the spiritual uh, aspect of homosexuality, the spiritual aspect being that God con condemns it and calls it sin, but even if you remove that and you just consider homosexuality as a practice, it, it's a self-destructive uh, practice extremely self-destructive uh, as a lifestyle. Those who practice it are far more likely to acquire uh, a, a, so any vast number of uh, sexually transmitted diseases. They're far more likely to uh, suffer from clinical depression. People who, who practice homosexuality, they have far, far more sexual partners than their heterosexual counterparts. I, I read a study the other day. I'm just going to read some highlights from it. it. It's a shocking study. It was done by some Dutch uh, researchers, but Bell and Weinberg, I'm going to read this, uh, says that 
their research indicates that the average male homosexual has hundreds of sex partners in his lifetime. Hundreds. Bell and Weinberg, in their classic study of male and female homosexuality, found that 43% of white male homosexuals had sex with 500 or more partners. 28% had 1,000 or more sex partners. It goes on and, and, and just gives a number of statistics that are absolutely uh, shocking. A survey conducted by the homosexual magazine Genre found that 24% of their respondents said they had more than 100 sexual partners in their lifetime. The magazine noted that several respondents suggested including a category of those who had more than 1,000 sexual partners. Uh, it, it makes us realize, it, it should make them realize, but I don't think it always does, that this this lifestyle is more about lust than it is about love. Yeah. It's giving place to unbridled lust so that one gratifies every sexual urge after another. And of course, uh, these encounters are uh, unhealthy, empty, uh, unfulfilling, self-destructive. I mean, imagine the possibility of acquiring sexually transmitted diseases, and of course, AIDS that ran rampant through the uh, homosexual community. It also leads to many other self-destructive habits, not, not only suicide, uh, uh, not only a depression, but a suicide, a much higher rate of suicide. Uh, also, uh, far more prevalent among the homosexual community is things like alcoholism, uh, drug abuse, and so on. And their average lifespan is reduced by about 24 years. So now this is just physical statistics, well-known, well-documented. It's an unhealthy, unhappy lifestyle. Amen. And yet there are no warning labels attached to it. You see, it's promoted by the American media, right. Hollywood, TV, movies, celebrities, celebrities. Yeah. You, know, you know how wise... Uh, and all-knowing America's celebrities are, uh, they promote homosexuality as a healthy, normal lifestyle. How come nobody says, however, if you practice it, your lifespan will be reduced by about 24 years on average, and your, the possibilities of you being depressed, I mean seriously clinically depressed, an alcoholic, a drug addict, uh, it, and acquiring all these horrible uh, sexually transmitted diseases, how, how come there's no warning labels for that? There's warning labels on a cigarette package if all you want to do is smoke. <laughs> all kinds of Surgeon General warnings, TV warnings. I mean, a kid can't ride a bike anymore. He's got to have a helmet on and pads on everything. And not, not saying that there's anything wrong with that, but don't you think that somebody's drinking the Kool-Aid here? And uh, it's the American public, without a, a question, uh, it's the American public that this, this is fostered on us as normal, healthy, uh, natural, you know. And again, this doesn't count what the Bible has to say about it, because we gave you a number of scriptures last time that dealt with that, and I, I'm not going to preach that message again. I don't want anybody to be angry at uh, the homosexual community even though they try to shove their lifestyle down our throats uh, and do everything in their power to indoctrinate our children in schools. Uh, I just saw where the University of Louisiana and Lafayette has begun a lesbian, uh, bisexual, transgendered course where now you can get a minor in, uh, in gay lesbian, bisexual, transgendered. Uh, the idea is to foster an understanding of the lifestyle. Uh, some of the most popular TV programs that mostly attract children, kids, teenagers, always promote homosexuality as a happy lifestyle. And the homosexuals are usually the wise ones, Every you know, that... that uh, or portrayed that way. Glee is famous for that. Uh, the 
the writers of Glee actually admitted that they had an agenda, that yeah. their agenda was to make homosexuality uh, acceptable, and they have Amen. wildly succeeded in, in their attempts. You know, uh, not to give credit to any of the other celebrities, but Victoria Jackson, who was a actress uh, with Saturday Night Live, got so fed up with the Glee uh, agenda that she spoke in news work, uh, New World Net Daily. World Net Daily. Listen to her, what she said. She said, Did you see Glee this week? Sickening. And besides shoving the gay thing down our throats, they made a mockery of Christians again. I wonder what their agenda is. Hey, producers of Glee, what's your agenda? One-way tolerance? <laughs> hey, that's exactly what they're fostering. One way We have to tolerate them, but they have no tolerance for right. bigoted, Amen. Bible-thumping, ignorant, redneck that's right. That's right. That's Christians. Amen. It's a one-way tolerance. Yeah. Well, once again, my... My purpose is not to, to demonize homosexuals, uh, even though there is a militant, a militant element within homosexuality that is determined to change uh, our entire culture. Uh, they want homosexual marriage to be accepted and normal. It's already accepted in eight states. They want to redefine what marriage is. Uh, they want to be able to promote the homosexual lifestyle as healthy, normal, alternate living. Uh, on our campuses, and uh, nobody tells you that homosexuality is self-destructive. No one will even give you these same statistics that we mentioned before. They've come out dozens of times in dozens of studies. They all say the same thing. Homosexuality is an extremely dangerous lifestyle to your health. Right. And, uh, and that fact alone should cause there to be warning labels all over it. But... You know, we operate out of a double standard here. Right. Amen. Uh, it's Christianity that's considered dangerous. Right. And attending church like this, you know, maybe you're getting brainwashed. Who knows? Amen. We, we can at least hose you off when you leave. Amen. <laughs> but praise God. That's not my text today. Um, but just to give you an illustration of how America is drinking the Kool-Aid because unquestioningly I don't know if you watch any of the stuff that's on TV hopefully not uh, but your children are watching it and your grandchildren are watching it and your neighbors and the kids down the street are watching it and guess what they are learning that homosexuality is natural normal healthy happy should be an accepted alternate lifestyle and anybody who says otherwise is an ignoramus yep. and you know also this militant element is also uh, doing their very best yep. to have it uh, considered as normal as being uh, black Italian right. Irish Hispanic right. and you can't say that you're Hispanic and therefore that's sin And if you can't say that it's a sin to be a Hispanic, then how can you say it's a sin to be homosexual? See, they're looking not, not for equality, but for privilege status. And you know what? Yeah. It won't be long before they get it. Yeah. It's already happening in other parts of the world, and uh, don't be surprised if it, if it begins here. Right. This is not the America you grew up in. No, it's not. Right. This is a changing America, but not just America. It's a changing world. And all of this uh, is happening, as the Bible said it would, in the last days. Uh, are you in Second Timothy chapter 3? Yeah. Okay, we're going to read a verse or two over here. Second Timothy chapter 3. This know also. Here's something the Lord wants us to know. Know this. Know this, that in the last days. When, when is this going to happen? In the last days... Perilous times shall come. Perilous times. Different versions translate this different ways. New American Standard translates it, Difficult times shall come. Williams translates it, 
Hard times will come. Linsky, grievous times shall come. Perilous, difficult, grievous, terrible. Terrible times are going to come. And then listen to what the Bible says is going to characterize the last days. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Lovers of their own selves. Interesting Greek word here, philautos. Uh, Philos is a Greek word for love, one of the words for love. Autos for oneself. So it's love of self, love of oneself. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, that means lovers of silver. That's what that word lives, philogros, lovers of silver. Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without normal love, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent. The idea there is uncontrolled, fierce. They're like wild animals. They can't be reasoned with. They can't be restrained. They're vicious. They're violent. Fierce. Despisers of those that are good. Huh. Despising Christianity, maybe. Traitors. Heady. High-minded. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. How about that? Men will be, first trade he mentions, lovers of their own selves. Lovers of their own selves. Not lovers of God, not lovers of their wife, not lovers of their husband or their children, but lovers of their family, lovers of good, lovers of right. No, they're lovers of their own selves. Self-lovers. Self-lovers. Some translate this word, they'll be selfish. But selfish isn't strong enough to describe what the Bible says will characterize the last days. Men will love themselves. And, and of course, he's talking about mankind. So women will love them, themselves. Men will love themselves. Now, interestingly, Jesus taught that in the last days, the love of many would wax cold. Matthew twenty four twelve. He says, the love of the many, because of abounding iniquity, the love of the many would wax cold. So there would be a lessening of love. But he was talking about a lessening of love, normal love. Love for God, love for truth, love for family, love for all the normal and right things. But what will actually increase, three things are mentioned here. People will love themselves. They will love money. Covetous, lovers of money, and they will love pleasure. Amen. So while Jesus said love will decrease, the right kind of love, right. actually love will increase all the wrong things. Amen. People will love all the wrong things. They will love themselves. The term for that is narcissism. Amen. They will love themselves. They will love things, money, the that is referred to as materialism. And they will love pleasure. Rich is referred to as hedonism. H-E-D-O-N-I-S-M. Hedonism uh, from the philosophy of the Epicureans. Hedonism. Pleasure is the central thing. The most important thing, pleasure, happiness, your own personal happiness. How about that? Materialism, hedonism, and the big one, narcissism. Narcissism is the mother of them all, actually. Amen. The love of self. That's what narcissism is. It's the root and mother of these others, the love of self. Nar narcissism, I know you've heard the term before. And you would think it's a term that comes from maybe psychology. But actually, it's a term that comes from mythology, Greek mythology uh, in particular. And I'd like to tell you just a little bit of the story of Narcissus, where it came from. Narcissus was, uh, in mythology, a Greek athlete, young, virile, and incredibly handsome. In fact, probably the most handsome ever, who, who ever lived, just chiseled by the gods themselves. He was a mortal, but his father was one of the some god, and his mother was a wood nymph or some, some such thing, you know, in fairyland, in, in uh, mythology. But 
as, he was incredibly beautiful, but he was also incredibly vain, incredibly egotistical, proud, arrogant, and he didn't care how he affected other people. He didn't care if his words hurt others. He didn't care if his actions, his behavior affected others. He didn't care about anybody but himself. Amen. Narcissist, that was his name. He was so handsome that all the beautiful maidens fell for him head over heels. Because, you know, then as now, people look at outward beauty and uh, that they fall for that. Most important thing is the package, right? Not the ingredients, but the package. You think that's true? <laughs> well, whether, you know, they say you can't judge a book by its cover, but the, and that is true, but the fact is the cover is what sells. Uh, it's true in marketing, and uh, it's true in, in people uh, attracted, being attracted to others. You know, it's, it's all about the packaging. Well... All of the beautiful maidens fell for narcissists, but he, he couldn't care less about them. Uh, he would just use them and abuse them, chew them up, spit them out. He had no regard for anybody's feelings, and he just broke their hearts. Everybody was beneath him. He had this spirit of entitlement, of arrogance, of pride, of haughtiness. Of He was just worried about himself, his feelings, his thoughts, because, you know, he loved himself. And in his vanity came cruelty, meanness, just ugliness, spite. He didn't care how he treated others. Well, to speed along the story, one of these uh, wood nymphs, I won't tell you the story about Echo, where that came from, but you can read it in mythology some other time. But he, he offended one of these wood nymphs who cried to the god of vengeance, actually the goddess of vengeance, and said, you need to do something to him so he'll know what it feels like. To, to have this unrequited love, to love somebody that doesn't love you in return. And the goddess of vengeance heard, put a curse upon him. So the narcissist went to this pool in the woods, the beautiful, spectacular, magnificent pool, and when he stooped down to drink from it, he saw his own reflection. And when he did, he fell in love. He fell, he fell head over heels in love with his own appearance reflected in the pool. Now remember, these were the days before mirrors, okay? So he, he saw this reflection and he was so enamored with himself that he couldn't leave. He couldn't leave the pool. He sat there and talked and cried and, and according to mythology... He never left that pool, but he actually withered and died. Forgot all about eating everything. You know, he was so madly in love. You know, when you're in love, you don't eat. You know, you just... <laughs> he fell madly in love with his own reflection and, uh, and obsessed with this appearance. He died. And flowers were found there later. They call them the narcissist flowers. I don't know if you've ever heard of those, but that's the flowers that grew by where he, he died. Some say he turned into a flower. I don't know. But how about that? Somebody obsessed with their appearance. Oh, wow. And ever since then, the term narcissist came into being. That is somebody who is like narcissists. Somebody like him. They loved themselves. They were enamored with themselves. They were obsessed with their appearance. In love with their own self. Didn't care about anybody else. How about this? Do you know that the Bible says that in the last days, men would be lovers of their own selves? Now, I want you to think about this. Because when the Bible speaks about it, it doesn't say that there will be certain individuals who have, you know, narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, it's not talking about that. There's always been a few people who were narcissists. Right. The Bible speaks of a plague of narcissism, a society given over to narcissism. In fact, an entire generation, a culture that has given itself over to narcissism, that is, self-love. Self-importance, feelings of entitlement, 
I matter, nobody else matters. And if, and if you do matter, it's only to the degree that you can make me feel better about myself. Only to the degree that I can use you to, to further my ends. Right. Narcissism is self-love to the nth degree. Yep. That's where we are. That's where we're living. Look, your Bible says this, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, perilous times will come. The very first thing that the Bible mentions, men would be lovers of their own selves. Yep. Self-absorbed, obsessed with their appearance. You think maybe we might be there? Conceited, self-important, uh, selfish, self-absorbed. I want you to listen to a couple of reports that, that I got, some from college, university studies, about a very alarming trend in the United States. One says this, imagine a person who does what he wants regardless of how it affects other people. They refuse to take responsibility for their own mistakes. They believe they're unbeatable. And of course, you know that they don't make mistakes. This article was written by, a, let's just say, a non-American. And they said, narcissism is on the rise in the United States, and it's likely to get worse before it gets better. The economic consequences will likely be severe. Americans today are happy to spend rather than sacrifice, leaving their future generations with the bill instead of accepting higher taxes themselves. They choose to keep bathing in a sea of cheap credit rather than cracking down on the practices and institutions that led to the financial crisis. And all along, they insist that their economic system is the best, even while neglecting future investments in the very things that make a productive society. Education, infrastructure, scientific research. And, and the article goes on. They cite several things. We consume more than we produce. We spend more than we earn. And we feel like we're entitled to do that. Because yeah. we're Americans. That's how we roll. <laughs> you know, gone are the old Puritan ethics. Puritans, boy, they get a bad name, I'll tell you. But we could learn a lot from the Puritans. Right. The old ethics of thrift, of industry, of saving, of living below your means. Amen. Imagine that. Whew. Who came up with a crazy idea like that? <laughs> Actually spend less than you earn and, and save some. Amen. Serve God. Amen. Be faithful. Live simply. You're right. Well, listen to this. Psychologists have been tracking narcissism through surveys of American college students since the late 70s and levels of it often measured by a lack of empathy have never been higher. According to Sarah Conrath, an assistant professor at the University of Michigan's Research Center for Group Dynamics, she says, if you look at the levers in society, almost all of them are pushing us towards narcissism, she says. These levers go beyond Twitter feeds and fa Facebook pages, which offer endless opportunities for self-admiration. They also include advertising that tells consumers, you're worth it. And reality TV shows that turn regular people against each other in a battle for celebrity. I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to belabor this point, but I think it's important to, for, for us to recognize that here in America, we're drinking the Kool-Aid. As a public, wholesale, and the church is not excluded. In fact, just a minute, I'm going to tell you the church is largely to blame. But wholesale, America is drinking the Kool-Aid and, and adopting narcissism as normal behavior. Uh, there's a book that came out called The Narcissism Epidemic. Why Today's Kids 
and adults feel so entitled. Huh. Why do we feel so entitled? And I'm going to just read a little bit from it. Narcissism or excessive self-love is marked by bloated confidence, vanity, materialism, and a lack of consideration for others. Yet narcissistic personality traits have become so pervasive in American culture that they threaten to transform us into a nation of egomaniacs. Research psychologist Gene Twinge and W. Keith Campbell say in their new book, The Narcissism Epidemic Living in the Age of Entitlement, Tw Twinge and her team at San Diego University also report today in a new study that narcissism continues to spread quickly among college students, especially among young women. Considering how cultural influences on girls have changed in the past decade, it's not surprising, says Twinge, plastic surgery rates have jumped since the 1990s. Materialism is increasingly being emphasized in song lyrics. And, of course, they, they cite quite a number of things here to sort of... Uh, justify their findings but let's let's just think about this for a moment do you think plastic surgery to i'm not talking about people who who need it because of a deformity maybe they had to have some surgery and that and now they need plastic surgery maybe they had an accident we're not talking about that we're talking about voluntary uh plastic surgery to enhance our attributes Maybe a woman wants to enhance, uh, augment, uh, you know, some part of her anatomy, uh, or uh, 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 suck something out, uh, uh, bloat something up, you know, the Botox. We spend ten billion a year on plastic surgery. We have more plastic surgeons in the United States than the rest of the world combined, uh, and we keep them busy. Because we are narcissists, because we are obsessed with our appearance, because we think appearance is everything, appearance is everything. It's not what's in here, it's how we look. So it's all about, you know, do I have, oh, oh, my nose. I've got to do something with this nose. Uh, I've... I've got to do something with these eyebrows, eyelids. Man, don't look at me. I, I, all, all these bags on the mouth. My, sometimes I think I'm going on a plane or something. All this baggage I pack along with me. <laughs> Listen here. Narcissism is sweeping through our culture more and more with each generation, each successive generation more so than the one previous to it. Amen. Uh, they put these folks, uh, uh, U.S. News and World Report did an interview with these folks about their book and asked them a few questions. They said, we're constantly being told by talk shows and pop psychology that we need to love ourselves. And so they said, is that wrong? Is that advice wrong? Their answer, well, having a basic sense of self-worth is a good thing. But when those feelings cross over into narcissism, it becomes toxic for other people, for the society, and for the individual in the long run. Here's a question. How is it that people can discard a spouse without, it's seemingly almost without a thought? How can they do that? Here's a person who's dedicated their life to living with you, maybe had your children, uh, and now you are attracted to this young one over there. And so you can dismiss this one just as easily as you, you donate your old clothing to a Teen Challenge. Just get rid of this one because his one, you know, why have a 40 when you can have two 20s? Or, uh, look, it's a narcissistic generation. People discard one another. They do not regard one another. They have no consideration for another's feelings. They can hurt. They can wound. They can injure by words and behavior. And it doesn't bother them in the least. Because you see, the narcissist 
is self-obsessed. My happiness. And look, this wife doesn't make you happy? Hey, there's a whole lot of fish in that sea. I do my best to catch some of them, but you know that. The, not the women, you know the fish. <laughs> Just to clarify. You know. <laughs> uh, moving along. <laughs> Here, here's something else they mentioned in the, in the interview. What's an example of how narcissism can, uh, well, they were talking about the result of, uh, how can narcissism actually contribute to the economic crisis? Here's what they said. Narcissism contributed to the economic crisis. Many people had a narcissistic overconfidence when they said, yes, I can afford that million dollar house. And the lender said, sure, I know you'll pay off that loan. And then fantasy collided with reality. <laughs> and the consequences have been worse for the economy than anything since the Great Depression. And, and they go on and say, look, obviously there were many different causes and factors in the, uh, in the collapse of the economy. But I think an unrecognized cause is that narcissistic overconfidence. Amen. I think that's an interesting observation. You buy more than you can afford because you forget thrift, you forget industry, you forget economy, yeah. and you live way beyond your actual means because you're entitled to it. You deserve it. And even in Christianity, we adopt it. I'm a king's kid. Hey, it's all for me. Wealth of the... We can lay it up for the, for the just. I'm just, I'm a king's kid, I deserve it, bless me. I mean, even our giving comes with that uh, caveat, bless me back, a hundredfold. Because it's not about God, it's about me. It's not about serving Him, He's our butler. Here's something else they said. Your book calls narcissism an epidemic. That's a strong word. Is narcissism really on the rise to that degree? Here's their response. This all started when we did a study a couple of years ago finding that narcissism was increasing substantially among a nationwide sample of college students. We compared that effect to the obesity epidemic and we found that the rise in narcissism was just as big as the rise in obesity in adults. That got us thinking. If obesity is an epidemic, then we've got an epidemic of narcissism on our hands as well. Amen. Then they asked, what do you think is fueling the rise in narcissism? Self-love. They said, we identify four causes. I want you to listen to these. Number one, parenting. Number two, celebrity culture. Number three, media and the internet. And number four, easy credit. Amen. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting read, but let me just point out a couple of highlights here. They said parenting is one of the major causes of the increase in narcissism. It's because, they said, we have begun to put children on the throne in the home. They are catered to, pampered, almost worshipped, to the point that children make decisions about everything. Uh, what they want to do, where they want to go. You want to go to church today? No? Okay. Children are at the center. They're at the forefront. They're at the throne and on the throne. And, and parents, parents revolve their life around the children. And it leads to narcissism. Because they think they should get everything they want. They think they should get everything. And they carry that sense of entitlement throughout life. So as young adults, they have this narcissistic Attitude, that's why they can't have decent relationships. That's why boyfriends, girlfriends come and go. They can't get along with anybody. That's why they can't hold down a job because nobody gives them the respect that they're entitled to. They don't feel like they should have to earn it. They're entitled to it. Then they said the celebrity culture. Well, certainly there's no narcissist 
on TV, I wouldn't think. People who are self-absorbed or obsessed with their own appearance. Those people are more the most Botoxed, lifted, sucked out, uh, artificial, plastic people on earth, made up. Uh, if they took their makeup off, you wouldn't even recognize them. Who is that? You're not no celebrity. <laughs> but this article uh, said that the, the, the shows that are the most popular are the reality TV shows. I, now, I didn't know this because I've never seen a reality TV show. Uh, somehow I just can't force myself to watch it. But the reality TV shows, they say, are the most popular among young people. And the people that they use in the reality shows are the most narcissistic of all. You know, it's all about self. It's all about me. It's the self-love entitlement. Well, then they said uh, another of the problems is media, uh, media and the Internet, which there's no question in my mind that we are f bombarded every day with materialism you know just uh, one commercial after another all the things that you have to have your life isn't worth anything if you don't have one of these and if and if you get one then you need the newer model or the or the next step up or the bigger one uh, uh, there's never any satisfaction and you know what else lacks in a in a narcissistic culture real gratitude real thankfulness it's just not there. Have you noticed a change that that there's the, the gratitude, the thankfulness, the, that that's disappearing in, in the American culture? That's right. Instead, we're entitled. Yeah. We're entitled not only to what we have, we're entitled to what you have. That's right. I'm entitled to that too. Amen. And then they mentioned the idea of... Uh, easy credit and I can see how that would fuel narcissism because we believe we deserve it and we don't believe we should have to wait for it and we don't believe we should have to to, to actually earn it and pay for it ourselves Amen. when we can just ring it up on plastic and and so because you deserve it you buy what you can't pay for Amen. you know the uh, old expression that America has three classes of people, the haves, the have-nots, and the have-not paid for what they have. So then, <laughs> but, but here's another consideration that I would like for each and every one of us to really consider, really take to heart. I believe that not only is our culture pouring Kool-Aid down the throat of the American public. But I believe the church is doing much of the same thing. Yeah, you're right. Especially when they promote this gospel of self-esteem. Yep. This false prosperity gospel Come on now. that feeds our materialism, it feeds our hedonism, yes. and it feeds our narcissism. Yes. That it really is all about us after all. Right. That even... I mean, who but Americans could turn Christianity into a consumer product? Yeah. I mean, it's actually about us now. It's not about Christ. It's not about worshiping Him, serving Him. It's not taking up the cross, following Him. It's not about that at all. It's about giving to get. It's about therapy. It's about Jesus making us happier. On, and that we'll give Him a little space in our lives as long as He improves our quality of life. There's no sacrifice, there's no cross, there's no denying self. It's all about pleasing self. And the church is very savvy in tapping into the market opportunity. Okay, we've got a nation of hedonists, we've got a nation of materialists, a nation of narcissists. Let's feed it! And they've been able, by tailoring their message... To feed our self-esteem and bring multitudes into what they call a church, but is actually some big uh, social club, enterprise. I don't know what it is, but I'll tell you what it isn't. 
it isn't the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because they don't preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel tells us that Christ came to save sinners. He came to save sinners. Paul said, of whom I'm chief. I'm chief of sinners. You, you can't tell people they're sinners in the social club. You can't do that. That would hurt their feelings. That would make them feel bad about themselves. And, and we can't do that. Not You can't tell narcissists that they're sinners. Because they'll tell you real quick, I'm a good person. Have you ever witnessed to somebody and, and, and asked them, have you ever received Christ as your Savior? Or, or you know, right. do you think if you died, you'd go to heaven? Oh, I would go to heaven. Right. Why would you go to heaven? Are you a Christian? Well, you know, I'm a nice person. Now, who but a narcissist would say that? The average person, a real, honest, genuine person would say, you know, I'm a liar. Um, I'm a thief. Uh, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. But not a narcissist. They're going to tell you how virtuous they are. They're going to tell you how good they are. Hello. I think the church is fostering this also upon a gullible public. Uh, it, you know God hates pride, right? These seven things does the Lord hate. Six abominations. He said, yea, seven does the Lord hate. Proverbs chapter 6. And what's the first thing he mentions? A proud look. A proud look. What is a proud look? It means haughty eyes. It's that arrogance, that better than you. Looking down on others. My superiority, my entire... Like, who are you? Wait, you talking to me? I'm so much better than you. You know, that's, uh, that's the very evil that the devil embraced. But let me tell you what the church found out. That if we tailor our message to the narcissistic tendencies in the American public, we will attract them we will be able to build an empire, a religious empire, by tapping in to the potential. Because people actually love themselves. So what we should preach is not that men are sinners, but that what they need is really to highly esteem themselves. Nobody was better at this than Robert Shuler. He perfected it. Uh, the first mega church pastor, the first uh, one who really preached the gospel of self-esteem, I want to read a couple things to you. Can you hang with me a couple more minutes? Listen to something Robert Shuler said. He said, I contend that man's unfulfilled need for self-esteem underlies every act. Over and over again, that the core of man's sin is not his depravity, but a lack of self-dignity. Self-esteem is the single greatest need facing the human race today. Did you know that? No. Every narcissist knows it. <laughs> you better believe they know it. There will be no humbling of ourselves before God. No calling on Him for forgiveness. No asking Him to wash us, cleanse us, deliver us, help us. No, we have the answers. I want you to listen to this quote from Robert Shuler. This appeared in Time magazine some years ago. He said, I don't think anything has been done in the name of Christ that, and under the banner of Christianity, that has proven more destructive to human personality and hence counterproductive to the evangelism enterprise than the often crude, uncouth, and unchristian strategy of attempting to make people aware of their lost and sinful condition. Nothing more unchristian than that, he said. Wait. In other words, don't tell people that they are sinners. That's the worst thing you can do. The worst, so, in other words, the worst thing you can do is preach the gospel. Because the, the gospel is that we're sinners. We're sinners in need of a Savior. And that all have sinned, 
All come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Uh, here's what Paul said, 1 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, he says, Christ has come into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm chief. Well, Robert Shuler was on TBN, Paul Crouch. And Shuler uh, answered Paul Crouch's question because he said, you know, it's been said that you don't preach repentance. So here's Shuler's answer. I preach repentance so positively that most people don't recognize it. Well, wait a minute. I, I want you to know how revealing that actually is. Nobody recognize. Well, you don't recognize it because it's not there. But his emphasis is positive. He gives this positiveness. Because you see, this is what feeds our self-esteem. This is what a narcissist will absorb, you know, like a hot air balloon. You, you feed us this self-esteem. You stroke our ego. You tell us how good we are. You tell us how much God loves us. But don't you come preaching repentance. That's right. Amen. I wonder if there's any church growth strategy in America today that embraces this philosophy. Amen. Maybe all of them. Or just about all of them. I'll tell you this, the self-esteem, prosperity gospel, seeker-friendly, uh, whatever you want to call it, they all embrace the Robert Shuler narcissistic model of Christianity. And what does it do? It fosters and feeds this self-love that is so ripe and rank in America. The gospel has been forsaken. Psychology has been embraced, embraced. Really and truly, it's all about self. Amen. Here's what the Bible says. In the last days, in the last days, men will be lovers of their own selves. What can you and I do about this? What can we do about it? What can we do to to prevent ourselves, to keep ourselves from being infected by this toxic uh, substance, this poison, this philosophy. Well, first you've got to recognize it for what it is. You don't know it's poison until you, until you are aware that it's poisonous. Amen. Hello. Amen. And then you recognize it for what it is. All of this positivism is poison. It feeds this hedonism, materialism, narcissism. Yes. Uh, America's, uh, we're, we're experts at turning everything into uh, a materialistic, hedonistic, narcissistic enterprise. Uh, I, I could actually take off on this real easy and talk about Christmas, for instance. Uh, I mean, who but Americans could take what's supposed to be a sacred, holy day and use it to fulfill our narcissism, yes. our hedonism, our materialism. Yes. Yeah, it's about us. It is. That's well, anyway, we won't go there. We won't go there, at least not today. Except to say that, but you and I, we need to be able to recognize the, the poison label when you see it. Or in our case, when you hear it. Amen. You know the little poison label? The skull and crossbones that's supposed to be wanting, don't drink that, don't eat that. don't. Right. Well, let's you and I be aware that there is a toxic so-called gospel spreading through America Amen. that is feeding the hedonism, materialism, and narcissism that's destroying our culture. It's anti-God, anti-Christ. It feeds the self instead of, as Christ said, if you want to be my disciple, you're going to have to deny yourself. Amen. Deny yourself. You're going to have to be a servant. A servant. You take up a cross. 
That means sacrifice. That means you put yourself out. You put self to death. And we follow Him, follow His example, follow His message. Amen. Not the Pied Pipers of Prosperity. But the simple gospel message that calls us to faith in Christ, turning, repenting of sin, and following Him with all of our hearts to the best of our ability, and trusting Him for the grace to live a life that will bring honor and glory to Him. Simple, simple Christianity. It's a, it's refreshing actually to hear it. Well, I got a few more pages of notes, but I guess I'm, I'm going to adopt the uh, the philosophy that when you beat a horse to death, dismount. <laughs> ah, hallelujah. Well, Father, we pray today that you do open our eyes and our understanding to the things that swirl in our own culture. Lord, we, we see your word that you predicted that this would characterize the very last days. Lord, we see increasing materialism in our culture, increasing hedonism, the pursuit of, of pleasure above all. And Lord, we see this growing self-love. And Father, we pray that you preserve and deliver us from it. Lord, let it make no further inroads in our lives. And, and Lord, help us to rid our hearts and minds and thoughts of, of all of these things, Lord. We see them as false values. We see them, Lord, as lies and contrary to the Spirit of Christ, contrary to the gospel message. Lord, help us to recognize these toxins when we see them and hear them. Help us, Lord, to not be persuaded by soft words uh, by soothing speakers. Let us see the toxic, the toxic element, Lord, in the gospel, the so-called gospel of self-esteem. And Lord, preserve us from it in our lives, in the lives of our children, in the lives of our grandchildren. Lord, we pray and help us, Lord, to live and proclaim the gospel of sincerity, the simple gospel that Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom we all are chief. Lord, it's, it's our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Amen.